Despite desperately needing a haircut and a shave, the weekly roundup is here. This time we have a whole lot of SBCs, really a huge bucket load of them, and a couple of other interesting things. There's a few interesting things on Kickstarter this week. Looking for a high resolution portable DAC? This one has a 1.5 amp hour LiPo claiming 7 hours of acquisition using an AK4490 DAC, pushing out a 768kHz 32-bit 2-channel audio from an Atmel SAM 3U1C and what looks like a Xilinx XC2 FPGA. Similar to the Tindy EMP sensor from weekly roundup number 46, this one is based on the AS3935 lightning detector and an Arduino Mini Pro low power. This one is interesting. It's a modular biological nervous system simulator based on open source hardware. Comes in kit form and teaches the concepts of neural networks without any coding. Comes with a swag of sensors, motors and brains to simulate your next robotic overlords. Plusboard looks interesting. It's a prototyping system based on a breadboard that allows you to transfer the components easily over to stripboard. It's not quite clear how they do that, but looks promising. It has a built-in power supply, adjustable from 3.3 to 30 volts, so it can accommodate almost every small circuit. The SBC wars are still going strong. This time a volley has come from the Libra computer guys. This board comes in the now standardized Pi form factor, and they have three variants. For $9 US, you get an all-winner H2 Plus SOC, 512 meg RAM, and for $19 US dollars, you get an all-winner H3 SOC and 1 gig RAM, for 29 US dollars you get an all winner H5 SOC with 2 gigs RAM. All boards mirror everything that you have on the Pi 2, so no Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, but they have an additional eMMC connector. If you're into retro gaming, then GameShell looks good. It's a portable modular gaming thingy. This main board is based on a quad-core all winner R16 with 512 megs RAM and SD slot and access to a bunch of GPIOs. There's also modular components such as a 2.7 inch TFT display, keyboard, battery and speakers. Not only can you play a lot of the old retro games, but you can create your own games using a variety of languages and IDEs. This one is interesting. It's an initiative to create a flexible licensing system for developers based on the MIT license. It essentially allows you to open source your software with a restriction placed on commercial entities having to pay royalties for use. The campaign was created to cover the cost of legal fees. Let's see how this one goes. If you've ever designed production test boards, then you'll be familiar with pogo pins. This Kickstarter is a simple one allowing you to connect to a Pi GPIO header using a pogo pin clip. Another IoT platform, this one is based on what looks like the ESP32, but this one looks to be fairly complete. They're not only offering all the hardware like sensors and drivers, but a cloud-based API that you can use to connect to other services like IFTTT, Zapier, Mailgun and Twilio. Another LED flashing kit. Not only does it have all the usual high brightness LEDs and USB chargeable LiPo, but this one has an onboard ATtiny85, so you can control the 32 RGB LEDs any way you want. Dev Dueno isn't the sensor board that has been selling on Seed Studio for some time, but another breadboard solution. Based on the 8 mega 3 tu 4 it also contains an SSD1306 based OLED, a header for Wi-Fi or Bluetooth module, SD slot, RTC and 17 GPIOs, with LED logic level display. Now this is a cool idea. If you've ever done any hand soldering of SMT, then you'll probably back this one straight away. SMD LEDs are a bugger to solder, and getting the right orientation can be a pain. Over at Indiegogo, there's... Oh, okay, nothing of interest. But Crowd Supply is cooking with gas. Not sure where they came up with the name Pulse Rain M10, but I'm sure it's a long story. This is another FPGA dev board based on one of the Altera Max 10 FPGAs that have a ridiculously long name. The exciting thing about this board is that it has a soft core 8051 based MCU clocked at 96 MHz with support for the Arduino IDE. There's also a Silicon Lab SI3000 voice codec, SD slot and JTAG. 
It all fits into the standard Arduino form factor, so you of course don't have access to the hundreds of GPIOs that this FPGA offers. It would be nice to include a header pushing out a lot more of these GPIOs. The Syzygy brain is, oh hang on, how do you say it? A Syzygy, Syzygy, I don't know. Anyway, it's yet another FPGA board based on the Xilinx Zinc Sock. So that means you get all the ARM Cortex A9 goodness bundled up with an FPGA. Has one gig RAM, gigabit ethernet, and four headers pushing out 112 GPIOs. Nice. This is a fairly simple board that contains a Pi CM3 DIMM socket in a PC104 form factor. Pushes out everything that the CM3 module has to offer, along with 59 GPIOs, but has an additional USB bridge and can run off a wide 8 to 36 volt DC supply. The reflow is a reflow oven for your PCBs, complete with iOS app. I guess if you back it and it doesn't work, you could always use it as a pizza oven. Oh, another SDR transceiver, but this one is a mini PCIe form factor. It runs the Lime Microsystems LMS 7002M and Xilinx Artix 7 FPGA, giving you a tuning range of 30 MHz to 3.8 GHz, and a sampling rate of 200 kilo samples per second to 120 mega samples per second. Back in weekly roundup number 36, we saw the Haas-scope, or however you say it. This is an open source, open hardware DSO for around 99 US dollars, based on the Altera Max 10 FPGA, giving you four 125 mega samples per second, 8-bit, 60 megahertz bandwidth channels, with the option to move to two channels at up to 250 mega samples per second. There's also an additional nine high res, low bandwidth channels at 12 bits and one mega samples per second, as well as 22 high-speed GPIOs, 16 I2C, JTAG, and an SPI interface connecting to an OLED. There's been a fair amount of talk about this over at the EEV blog forums, essentially comparing the bandwidth to dollar ratio. I reckon it's a pretty decent DSO for the price. There's nothing new on GripGets this week, sadly, but over at 4D Systems, they have released a new 0.9-inch TFT HMI called the IOD09, that has onboard ESP8266, SD slot, and all their GPIOs are broken out for only 20 US dollars as well. Hmm, just might pick one of these up. Over at Hackaday, there's a project up for a USB to UR bridge, but this one is based on the MAX12931, which provides excellent galvanic isolation. This means it electrically isolates the USB side from the serial side, so you won't have noise from your PC injected into your device, or the device won't kick back any high voltages to your PC. Of course, the Hackaday Super Conference was on last weekend, and they've put up lots of talks that happened. So go check out the Hackaday YouTube channel. The Banana Pi guys have come out with a challenger to the Pi Zero W. Called the Banana Pi M20, it has the same footprint and all the same goodies as a Pi Zero W, but has an additional RF connector, reset and power buttons, and runs the all winner H2+. The one good thing about this sock is that it can push out 4K HDMI, so it's a pretty good competitor to the Humble Pi. Over at Digiland, they are jumping on the SPC bandwagon and have released a Xilinx Zinc 7010 based board called the Zybo Z7. There's two flavors, the Z710 with one sock and the Z720 with two socks. Both boards have 1 gig RAM, 16 meg SPI flash, SD slot, gigabit ethernet, HDMI and GPI headers coming from the FPGA. The friendly guys have come out with two new boards. The first one called the Fire 2A, which is based on the Samsung Quad-Core Cortex A9 S5 P4418 sock and 512 megs RAM. And the Fire 3, which moves to the Quad-Core Cortex A53 S5 P6818 with 1 gig RAM. Both boards have gigabit ethernet, SD slot, DVP interface, USB, RTC, standard GPIO header, and they have inventively replaced the AXP288 PMIC with an STM32 MCU to manage power states. So the STM32 will be able to power up and shut down the main SOC. Nice. One board have come to the party with three new SBCs based on the quad-core Cortex A53 IMX 8M SOC. The Lite has 1 gig DDR4 RAM and 4 gigs EMC. The Pro has 2 gigs DDR4 RAM and 8 gigs EMC. And the Deluxe has 2 gigs DDR4 RAM and 16 gigs EMC. 
All three boards have Gigabit Ethernet, USB 3.0, Pi compatible 40 pin GPIO, USB-C and the Pro and Deluxe have Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Novtech, in conjunction with Arrow Electronics, have produced an SBC called the IMX796. Not only is it a 96 boards compliant, but it runs the NXP IMX7 SOC with 512 meg RAM, SD slot, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, USB 2.0, and runs off a 8 to 18 volt 3 amp DC supply. It has some pretty decent low power modes, able to get down to 250 microwatts in standby mode. Waveshare have come out with a Pi CM3 based board that breaks out everything possible from the module. It also has a DS18B20 1Y IC, USB to UART, 10 bit 38 kilo samples per second 11 channel ADC, and also a 16 bit 2 channel DAC, RTC, and Arduino compatible headers. Even though the website says it's coming soon, you can actually fetch the latest version of Retro Orange Pi. If you already have version 3.0.1, then you can upgrade by downloading and running a simple script from the Retro Orange Pi website. If you haven't used Arduino Create before, it's a cloud-based IDE that allows you to program your Arduino devices without having to download and update an IDE on your PC. Support has now been added to include Linux, so you can update your Linux devices as if they were an Arduino device. Nice. The Hard Kernel guys are finally selling their Odroid MC1 cluster. This contains four Odroid XU4S boards, heatsink and fan. So for $220 US dollars, you get a 32 core, eight gigabyte RAM cluster. They have also published several getting started guides for a Docker Swarm and a build farm. Interestingly, the Pi64 guys seem to be looking at producing yet another SBC. This time, based on the all winner H6, it will contain one, two or three gig RAM, gigabit ethernet, SD slot, RTC, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and mini PCIe connector. Looks promising. ST Micro have come out with a new ultra low power MCU series called the STM32 L4 Plus. This new MCU can drop down to 20 nanoamps without RTC and 5 wake up pins or 43 microamps per megahertz. That's a seriously low quiescent current. There's several different models providing TFT and MIPI DSi interfaces. Over at my favourite store, Tindy, there's a bunch of cool things. We saw the Ultimate by 8 back in weekly roundup number 29 on CrowdSupply. Well, this simple board allows you to connect three Ultimate by 8 RGB LED boards together into one unit without soldering. The Wi-Fi deauthor is a small device that initiates the deauthor attack on a Wi-Fi network. Well, now it's at version 2.0 and has better LiPo charging control, faster power on, and a better 2 dB antenna. Powerbrick looks like a decent power supply. It comes in kit form and provides two regulated outputs that provide two selectable voltages, either at 5 or 3.3 volts at 5 amp peak or 4 amp continuous. It also has reverse pins so you can mount it onto a breadboard and a USB power connector to power SBCs. Here's a fairly cheap 2G mobile hat for a Pi based on the NeoWay M590E 2G module. Access is over serial port. This board seems to have the lot, running the IMX233 SOC as a main CPU. It also has an 8 mega 328 and SIM 900 GSM module. 64 meg RAM, SD slot, 46 GPIOs coming from the IMX SOC, 8 from the SIM 900 and 16 from the 8 mega 328. Runs off a 6 to 12 volt DC supply and can charge a LiPo from solar panel. The BME680 is a pretty decent ITC sensor. It contains temperature, humidity, pressure and gas sensors all in one package. This board has a small buck converter and logic level converter so it can handle 3.3 or 5 volt logic levels and DC supply. Pesky Products has made a Tindoff IMU board that is the next step up from the MPU9250. This one contains several ICs providing much lower current draw, faster measurements and lower jitter. This micro SD breakout is similar to another one on Tindy, but has standard 0.1 inch spaced headers instead. And this small board has an 8 mega 328P and RFM69 LoRa module, powered off a coin cell battery. It also has temperature, humidity and light sensors as well. Firmware delivered supports OTO programming and supports my sensors. Did you miss the Hackaday Super Conference? 
And did you miss out on the Super Conference badge? Well, you can pick one up on the Tindy Hackaday store. With this board, you should be able to retrofit it to any quadcopter that uses brushed DC motors. Runs an STM32L4 as the brains and has an MPU 9250 9 DOF IMU, MS5637 barometer, and EM7180 motion coprocessor, providing 10 DOF fusion output. This board should be pretty stable, and I think I might just order one of these as I have a quadcopter that has a pretty basic RF remote. Bluechip Plus is a pretty tiny Bluetooth 5.0 breakout board. I think it's the smallest NRF52832 based board I've seen so far. Now this is actually pretty cool. Someone has created a Wave audio player using an ATtiny85. Can handle 16-bit stereo 48kHz WAV files. No idea on the SD card size limit, but it's pretty cool anyway. And from the major shop fronts, there's something for the hammies over at ITED with their AirSpy HF Plus, which is an SDR for the HF and VHF bands. Capable of frequencies from DC to 260 MHz, it has some decent SNR specs for the price. Seed Studio have their cheap mini LiDAR, which is capable of detecting objects from 300mm to 12m. Interfacing is over UART and runs off a 5V supply. They also have an OBD CAN bus dev kit that can work at up to 1 megabits per second, Access is over plain old UART. Over at Adafruit they have their AT Sam D09 breakout board with Seesaw firmware. And their Mini Boost charge pump giving you a 100 milliamp 5 volt DC supply from a 3 volt input. And they also have their digital power meter that's capable of handling 6.5 to 100 volt DC at 20 amps. Over at SparkFun they have the Arduino MKR1000 in stock which is based on the AT Sam W25 SOC and includes LiPo battery management. Or if you're into satellite comms, the Rock Block 9603 allows you to send short messages using the Iridium SATCOM service. It's an expensive unit, but allows you to communicate from anywhere in the world. Of course, you'll have to fork out for line rental, which is around $13 US per month. SparkFun also have their TB6612 based motor driver breakout, allowing control of two motors at up to 3.2 amps peak, runs off a 2.7 to 5.5 volt supply, while the motors can be driven at up to 15 volts. A digital pot is a handy thing to have around. DF Robot have a breakout for a dual 100 kilo ohm digital pot, runs off a 3.3 to 5 volt supply, with the 8 bit wipers being able to change within one millisecond. Access is over SPI. This shield is designed for DF Robots M0 and contains the Wolfson WM8978 audio processor as well as dual 3 watt amplifier, mic and SD slot, capable of decoding 3D surround sound and also has a programmable notch filter. DigiKey has the Thunderbolt Sense 2 in, which is an IoT dev kit from Silicon Labs. Runs the wireless Gecko, which is a multi-protocol radio with an ARM Cortex-M4 core and also has temperature, humidity, pressure, hall effect, IMU and light sensors. Also has an integrated J-Link debugger. Yet another FPGA dev kit, this one from Lattice and is aimed at video processing. Runs off a 12 volt DC supply, it has two MIPI CSI2 connectors and an ECP585 FPGA for image signal processing. This next one is the Rolls-Royce of stepper driver boards. It's a bit expensive, but can drive two-phase bipolar steppers with selectable current from 500 milliamps to 2.8 amps off a 10 to 30 volt DC supply. Has some complex motor control such as S-shaped ramps, stall guard and chop sinking. GE has some decent boost modules. These ones can push out 16 to 54 volts DC at two amps from an eight to 16 volt DC input. You can pick them up for around $20 a pop. Over at Palolo, they have a bunch of high power DC brushed motor drivers. This one designed for an Arduino has a dual H bridge allowing a 6.5 to 30 volt operating range. And they claim it can handle up to 22 amps without a heatsink. Hmm. Or this one designed for a Pi capable of handling up to 18 amps without a heatsink. Hmm. So that's about it for this week's roundup. There's actually a lot more that I didn't include in this video, but I've put everything up on my website, so check that out when you get the chance. Thanks for watching, and see you next week.